Uh, so yeah, today we're going to talk about a different topic. So we're kind of going to go to the back end. So mostly it's about all the software on the front end, but then let's actually have a chat about the back end, um, which is quite, it's very, very important. And, um, and this has been like a really big focus for us. It's one thing that like uh, Juan talks about uh, 10xing the value proposition. Well, actually, we think it actually has to start here with what can actually needs to happen in the back end. So um, Holland is like a storage provider out of Australia, just so you know, and it's kind of like here. I'll just put a bit, a bit of an introduction. We're um, doing small scale data centers um, fueled by um, you know, uh, uh, green energy in that way. So um, when you look at the big problem I see today is that it's, it's really that the current data infrastructure cost is way too expensive to scale. Like this is like becoming really, really apparent. So let me just explain this to you in more detail. Firstly, um, I think everybody rolls out this lovely IDC uh, statistics. We think that is well and truly off the mark. So actually up until 2020, we generated about 30% uh, compound data for human generated data. And we're now going into an era, as we all realise here, machine to machine. I think everybody here would actually say data generation going forward is going to be greater. 42%, I'm not 100% sure. We wrote a big report. We actually put out seven reports, uh, um, each one quite a mammoth tome on actually understanding what the underlying drivers actually are, are here. And I'm a big EV fan, a big Tesla fan, so that's partly what's actually happening on EV. We're working in digital twin technologies. We can see this. We are vastly underestimating actually what's going to happen. So that's the first thing. Second thing, um, we can see that uh, essentially uh, from um, the percentage of what we're storing, of course, natural resource actually has been declining. But, um, and this is uh, the, from 2011 to 21, 30% compound in terms of the storage mediums out there. You can actually calculate this very accurately, practically from the, the public data, Seagate, Western Digital and others. But you can see as we move forward, you know, it's kind of like uh, with the generation we've got, we're just going to have less space. So that's, that's something to actually consider in terms of actually where, where things are actually heading um, uh, over, the, uh, over the years ahead. Um, the thing here also is, uh, as time goes on, we, we only see that it's kind of like um, this is going to escalate, we think, with um, particularly as we move into what we call data as an asset class. And of course, that's what the Web3 technology is looking to enable, um, digital property rights, property rights, um, uh, and, and that, that's, that's, that's very, very, very exciting um, yeah, in that way. Um, obviously, you know, uh, as Seagate highlighted a couple of years ago, where we're generating the data um, is at the edge. Now, we call it the edge today, but really it's the centre. Um, it's called the edge because it's the edge related to data centres. It's actually the centre of the population. It's where actually we, we actually need actually data storage is actually, um, and compute, is actually more in the pop populated areas. Of course, most data centres are not in populated areas in, in, in the extent. And data gravity is going to be a much, much bigger thing going forward. Some of the digital twin use cases we're seeing are cre going to create a phenomenal amount of data. You don't want to move that around. Um, of course, we think the uh, compute will start to follow um, the, the data to the edge, and the, the edge will become more critical in that way in terms of the way we actually do things. Um, the big thing that to, to to really uh, focus on here um, is the energy consumption here. That, that, so what, what we've seen here, and this is a report done by Goldman Sachs, that essentially there's two things to note on this gra graph of, of importance. Firstly, the efficiencies from hyperscale had rolled out over the last um, decade or so, they're coming to an end. We can see this we, we, we're, when you're in data centres. Um, they're all like air, with air-cooled systems. And the other thing, they've started to do calculations about how much energy consumption as a result of what's happening with the transformation in AI. Everybody knows ChatGPT consumes a lot more energy than just doing a plain um, uh, Google search. That number is an enormous number, like 15% compound on already the data consumption that we have today. So in the US, for instance, they're talking about the, uh, that data centers could end up consuming 8% of the grid. It's a very big number. Also, in terms of um, the impact on grids as a whole, we're going to actually see grids grow again. Utility scale grids haven't really grown, or the electricity grid hasn't really grown over time. This causes problems. This will actually end up causing some problems. We've got to get vastly more efficient with the energy that we consume. So the problem that we see today, and this is again through, um, uh, uh, you can see this in just even the results of the very, very large companies, uh, how much they're spending in the last 12 months uh, and the ecosystem, and there's a trillion dollars forecast in 2027. Half of that's going to be from like six companies in the world. 
Now, the question is, if we keep going this path, <laughs> can we afford that price tag uh, as we move out? That's the problem. That's what we've got to actually um, work on uh, and, and solve. We think the solution to this is actually through distributed data networks. And what we're doing in Web3 is actually creating open global commodity markets with data. So think about it. I come from Australia. So I understand this pretty well because I come from a country that's just blessed with resources. We run iron ore, coal, uh, iron ore, coal um, copper markets. We've developed these over time to get vastly better capital allocation mechanisms when it comes to actually um, running the world. And that's what we, we, we see is that uh, is required. So firstly, when we, we see this um, uh, date, distributed data is actually going to meet distributed energy. It's going to be this great marriage. And I've kind of got like an indication here how this actually works. Like in a country like ours, um, green energy at the edge is just vastly cheaper. Take out transmission, take out distribution costs. Um, you can see that even if you had this magic sort of power station generating it was green, it's still going to be more expensive than what you could do at a smaller scale at the edge. You can then start to develop competitive advantage on energy in the right location. That's actually critical. Of course, solar costs, we've been on this cost curve over time and coming down demonstrably. Um, also, batteries doing the same thing. So EV uh, has, uh, and what's happening with Tesla, uh, BYD, etc., and also the commercial scale installations uh, of batteries on utility networks as we go greener, as leading to a vastly declining cost curve. And that also changes some of what we can actually do um, uh, in smaller scale data centers and how they actually can be fueled. Of course, this is the biggie. When you kind of look at it, it's kind of uh, air cooling, you know. It worked. So this photo here, you can see here, I've got on the left here, I've got a pharaoh, and he's kind of thinking he's, everybody's trying to fan him. So at the moment, when I operate in a traditional data center, I go in, it's like a big fridge, and everybody just keeps chucking the, the, uh, the trying to cool it down. And I'm trying to get my equipment actually cool in that situation. Actually, if you go to immersion systems, like what actually Holon has, and where the world's actually heading, you, don't have, you get vastly better outcomes in the way you, do, you actually cool things. Vastly better. So you end up, end up. Uh, here's some of the benefits here. You can see that um, loss panel, uh, less physical space, less spend on the infrastructure. We can um, less energy used, and we can also recycle the energy. In many cases, we can take PUE, which is like a measurement of in the data center space. We can actually take it uh, below one. So we're recycling that energy. That's very exciting. Exciting. And some places like Germany in the world, they're actually mandating. PUE targets, no, um, certain amount of green energy, and how you're actually recycling the energy is going to be key. As we're going to go. And we think that recycling in, in particular is going to be very significant going forward. Of course, the other major thing that's going on, which is not talked about enough, is like this, where everybody understands this, the centralised system versus the distributed system that we're actually building into. So for us, the key focus here is that we want to take redundancy into the software layer there and then substantially reduce the capex required to actually run these things. Do I need to run a tier four data centre is the question that actually comes out of that. And there is a material difference in the cost of a tier four data centre versus a tier one, and a lot of it all relates to, uh, to redundancy. That's a big part of that capex spend when you actually look at the previous charts. We've got to actually get that down. And it's vastly better to do that with a distributed network effect in how we actually achieve that outcome. So this, this is quite, quite exciting for us because when we start to combining these um, you know, emerging cooling, renewable energy, we start using the benefits of distributed networks, then we can materially lower capex and opex um, in our operations. And then when you lower that, the magic things can actually happen. So we can actually start doing a lot of things that are probably not even possible uh, today. So this is like a really big focus for us, um, at, uh, has been a big focus for us, because it's kind of like we get this right, then we're in a position where we're going to be very cost competitive, even at today with, we don't have the scale of the big guys. But this is where we think we need to start. Of course, where we look at the world, we're going to go from 8,000 data centres to 8 million modular data centres. It's going to be in within the population to support this uh, growth with this model. That's where we can actually see it actually growing. We're going to run things automated. You know, it's going to be a very different approach to actually how we actually uh, uh, run, run data. 
but we think, you know, again, another big advantage of this model, of course, is uh, the bandwidth costs as well. So that's, we've been talking about this a lot. Data gravi gravity, not using the, the bandwidth, bringing the compute to the data, to taking the actions we need, minimizing that is like is critical as well. So we're pretty excited about what this could actually enable in terms of applications and things that can actually be built. Um, so the big opportunity here, surprisingly enough, is for commercial real estate companies. So if you're a commercial real estate company uh, at the moment, um, the last few years have been tough, very tough. You've had to face post-COVID work changes. You've got AI eating into your future because everybody's looking at the potential that you're going to have your occupancy and your rates you know, um, markedly downgraded. And this is a sim uh, systematic thing, so it's hard because it's all happening to all of them. You've had material rise in interest costs. So all of them, all these property trusts um, have big balance sheets with a lot of debt funding. Uh, so essentially that impacts you very dramatically uh, as dramatically as well. And all, all of them are required to decarbonise, by the way. All of them being mandated by their various governments around the world policies to go green. So the beauty about what Holon can come and do in working with us, we can pay your rent, um, we can we can also help you with actually going greener with the properties uh, and using technologies uh, with digital twin partners to help with the financing cost to actually help with that decarbonisation effect. Reduce your interest cost on your bills, um, but importantly, repurpose your property and get you back in the game when it comes to actually saying AI is going to benefit you, not disrupt you. So we think this is like suddenly we see globally you can start turning traditional property networks into data networks to actually support it. And I think this, is, this solution is like, for our, for our perspective, is like, you know, it's, um, it's resonating. We're having these conversations with a lot of uh, big real estate players globally, um, and they can see, the, uh, see, see that opportunity um, uh, at this point in time. Overall, like Holland's mission, we want to accelerate that transition uh, to, to green data. And like a lot of other people we're talking about here, um, it's about empowering um, you know, data, data ownership, which is another big topic um, uh, down, 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 down the track. But feel free to approach me. We're here to help. We know this path is not easy, hasn't been easy, to actually get there, identify what needs to be done. But I think this is like a, like a pathway where we start to actually create some competitive advantage, particularly on the cost outcomes that we, that we can achieve relative to the major competitors. Thank you for being here today.